Hello friends, <clears throat> as uh, you know that we have been uh, running this series on European drama and uh, now we are um, at the fag end of the series. Uh, it might take another couple of months or a little more. And uh, today's uh, <clears throat> discussion uh, on uh, modern drama uh, would be with respect to J. M. Singe and the playboy of the western world. And uh, you know that J. M. Singe. Uh, you must have heard if you are a, if you are an MA student or have have, have done MA and, and have gone beyond you know to MPhil or PhD, then you would know that uh, J M Singe was one of the finest uh, dramatic voices of uh, Ireland. Uh, he wrote in English, and uh, uh, because he had the Irish background, so you can understand the sophistication as well as the courage of the author. Uh, to express his views, to uh, present his image, to excite our imagination, uh, and to do so honestly and genuinely. So, J. M. Singe is the author, and uh, I'll be uh, having in mind always his most famous play, The Playboy of the Western World. And uh, I'll tell you uh, in the beginning about the, uh, uh, you know, words used in the, uh, you know, the, the title. Uh, the, the playboy of the Western world, what exactly uh, does it mean and uh, whether you know uh, it gives us a way, a view, uh, a vision of the play that we will be discussing. But as uh, <coughs> we always emphasize, me and uh, the team of which I am a part, that uh, literature is not an independent entity in, in life. Literature is actually, uh, you know, uh, all the time. Uh, has uh, a vital link with the society in which it is produced and therefore uh, it is important that we consider it as the play of an individual uh, whose name is James Singe and who comes from Ireland as already I have explained. And uh, Ireland has that uh, specificity about it as a background. You know it's a, it's a part of England today, United Kingdom, but it always stresses uh, its importance and its independence. And in fact, uh, Ireland has now uh, two parts uh, in it, all the time active, the northern part, which is uh, closely linked with the British regime, and the southern part, which is uh, more or less independent and uh, calls itself the Republic. So you know that the country is divided, Ireland is divided into two parts, and these two parts all the time clash uh, for asserting uh, their, their views or, or their rights. And uh, James Singe may be a very... Uh, a fine product of the duality, the clash uh, and, and, and the struggle that uh, Ireland uh, had conducted at the time and was in the middle of doing so at the time when James Singe was alive and he wrote this play. Uh, <coughs> the full name of the author, the dramatist that we discuss is Edmund John Millington Singe. So, you know, this is like the long names of some of us in India also, that uh, when the name is mentioned, then the parent's name might be mentioned and sometimes even the place from where one belongs is mentioned. So, it is a long name. But then for our purpose and then for the ease of use, we can say that he is uh, John Singe. Uh, and he is an Irish playwright, as I already told you. He is a poet. Uh, he is poet uh, in his own right. He has written poems independently, lyrics he has written. And uh, when he doesn't write poetry and uh, writes plays, then you can see the presence of the poet uh, in the text uh, th that he gives to his plays. And uh, the last part is that he is the collector of folklore. Now, collector of folklore has uh, many associations. The, the most important one is that the person uh, is a scholar of the folklore, uh, goes from one place to another uh, to, to collect, you know, episodes, uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, whatever folk tales are at, the, at that time relevant are, are at that time popular and that while doing so he also establishes a connect with the culture of the place where he roams around. So he is a collector of folk to, folklore and uh, he might also be using, you might think, he might also be using uh, some of these folk tales while writing his plays because uh, folk tales you know have built into them a kind of a structure that is uh, closely reflecting life. And since uh, writers and playwrights in particular always deal with 
the social problems, the ideological problems, and uh, present uh, not merely views but also people, uh, the, the characters uh, on the stage. Therefore, folk tales become doubly important. It is these characters who have been, you know, nurtured on uh, ideologically on the folk tales uh, right from the beginning of their life. The second thing that I say in the beginning is that uh, <coughs> uh, he was, that is, uh, uh, J.M. Singe was actually a part of Irish literary revival, Irish literary renaissance. These are the two expressions. I use them, uh, uh, you know, together uh, interchangeably. And uh, revival and renaissance are quite close to each other in terms of meaning and uh, uh, which suggests and in the beginning we should be clear about it, which suggests that there was a time perhaps in the history of Ireland when uh, things had gone entirely dull, entirely static uh, and, and entirely indifferent to the world around and then you know the genius of the place, the mind of the place, the awareness and, and sincerity of people that was deeply hidden in their heart that came out and they started express the, uh, expressing themselves in social behavior, in, in, in exchange of views as well as in expression which is literary in nature. So literature of the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century became a different kind of a literature and broke new ground and uh, in fact uh, it was done not by one person alone, it was done by a lot of people uh, coming from Ireland and uh, they you know are in fact uh, changed the entire map of, of, of uh, 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 the, the, this country's culture and uh, that uh, it can easily be called the Renaissance. And the Renaissance is literary, uh, it is not uh, uh, so social as much as, as, as for our purpose today. It is literary which means a new kind of literature and uh, at the same time a literature that may have existed in the uh, you know, uh, older history uh, of, of the place. Uh, that literature was recognized and uh, was given a new form and uh, the kind of impetus that the writing of these writers in the in the 19th century would have given to uh, the, the uh, literature of the, of, the, of the time would have called their effort the renaissance effort. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's something you know that uh, inspires us, uh, we uh, in fact get connected with uh, the renaissance a uh, literary renaissance that is there in uh, uh, Ireland and we can you know let then you know go forward. So uh, do not please say that uh, uh, all English literature at the turn of the century uh, towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century is uh, modernist in the in the negative sense of the word that you know it talks only about the individual and his inner you know problems of uh, uh, uncertainty. That is not the case. So far as uh, literature coming from Ireland is concerned, uh, that you know uh, depicts uh, something different and uh, that, uh, that you know uh, in fact uh, has the vitality uh, that we generally associate with good literature of the early 19th century and, in, and even the later 20th century. So uh, <coughs> that, uh, that is reflected in, in, the, in the writing of this person and uh, he was born let us say in 1871. So which means he spent the first 29 years of his life in the 19th century and that was the century when he was a contemporary of, uh, for instance, Oscar Wilde, he was a contemporary of uh, Bernard Shaw and, and, and he was able to, you know, uh, learn from them and, and he, he would have something to give as, as a food for thought to some other people also. So he was raised in an upper class home, uh, that is important which means he would have got good education, he would have got a sense of culture and uh, as, a, as an upper class home, uh, he would be, uh, you know, not exposed as much to the dangers of life as some others might have been because uh, the protection came from the upper class to which he belonged and he studied a lot. He, he got good schools to, uh, to, to go to for studying and he could choose his profession uh, with, without any hindrance. Uh, other people have the, you know, uh, responsibility of running a home, of earning money, of attaining stability that is economic and social in nature. This person had uh, no, not those worries uh, in his life and, uh, uh, well, one uh, 
Now, bad thing uh, to happen in his life was that his father died within two or three months of his life uh, of, of uh, James Singer's birth, uh, Singer's birth, and he was brought up entirely by his mother. Now, when he, one is a mother's son and not 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 the son of the father and mother together, then there is a peculiar kind of uh, mental structure that one evolves uh, in the, in the course of one's life. And uh, in this case, uh, his mother was uh, a devout religious person, and uh, she believed deeply in religion. Uh, and uh, you know, the uh, religion of the place was uh, Roman Catholic, uh, uh, not Protestant as much. There may have been some Protestant pockets also. That uh, and in fact depends upon the atmosphere uh, of the country at that time. So uh, <coughs> the mother was devoutly religious. And uh, but that was not the case with the son, uh, G. M. Singh, uh, because uh, he could, uh, you know, with courage look around and and learn on his own uh, about the realities uh, that surrounded him. In 1893, uh, you know, when uh, he is a, a young man, uh, Singh left Ireland to study music in Germany. So I, I particularly highlight this. He started his career. Uh, as, as, as you know, uh, uh, with with the pursuit in music, and that music would be German music. So he went there, and uh, he tried to you know understand the nuances of uh, the music there. That may have added to his sensibility. That may may have added to his uh, you know literary skills also. But then he didn't find uh, that particular uh, field of uh, culture uh, appealing, and therefore he soon shifted to France. To do language and literature studies, that was his forte. So he would, he became interested in language, not in music. Music is not language. Music is uh, basically sounds, uh, harmonious sounds, and uh, you know there is a whole tradition of music in all countries of the world, and uh, music is is a world of its own. So uh, he shifted to language, and the moment you shift to language, you you uh, you you shift to a system of signs. You you um, uh, go into the system of knowledge and, and the way knowledge is conveyed, uh, you know, through sound patterns. That's what language is, and that in fact is the purpose of language and literature studies. So language studies and literature studies, and uh, what does liter lit literature studies uh, signify in the late 19th century? Uh, people had started uh, using the philosophical method. The method of analysis, the method of uh, logic, the, the the method of uh, knowing actually what literature says, and uh, then you uh, you know analyze it, and uh, with the help of the analysis you gain uh, the depth uh, you know in, in in the in the idea of literature. So uh, uh, literature studies is is not very old uh, in tradition. Mostly in schools you know literature was not taught, but so far as Europe is concerned, it was far ahead of other countries in the world. And uh, literature had become uh, uh, a subject of studies, uh, as is clear from uh, this particular expression. And therefore, he shifted uh, from 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 Germany, where he had gone to study music, to France. In France, literature studies uh, would have been uh, quite uh, popular, and uh, that appealed to his heart and mind completely. Those stood him in good stead in the field of literary expression. Yes. That's true. That if you study language, if you study uh, literature, uh, then you can become a good writer because already you know the kind of skills uh, that have been used by other people, forged by other writers in the past. So you uh, read them, you learn about the skills, you you start you know following their method, and then you can uh, you know uh, in, in the process of doing so, you can. Develop your own method of writing, because after all, what you read belongs to the past, but what you write actually should belong to your present and the world around it. And therefore, uh, you are under compulsion to write your kind of literature. And when you write your kind of literature, then definitely the, the study of literature helps. So uh, <coughs> these are the uh, you know uh, things. These are the factors. Uh, that, that 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 make him equipped with with, with the knowledge of how to express uh, one's emotion, uh, one's ideas, and one's images and whatever is there in one's mind. W. B. Yeats, 
another Irish writer, a giant, you know, in the uh, in, in the field of literature uh, at the time. Uh, he was the contemporary uh, of uh, and a senior person uh, to this uh, 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 Singe. And uh, he inspired Singe to go to Aran Islands now uh, 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 off the coast of Ireland. So you have islands there and islands are somewhat distant from the mainland. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, they are able to, uh, you know, maintain their purity, uh, but at the same time, their knowledge is limited. In fact, uh, the kind of uh, differences that, that, that finally emerge in the course of living in social life uh, in, 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 in islands uh, offers a kind of challenge to uh, the, the, the people who go there. They want to learn, they have to learn the language, the, the, the way the, the islanders speak and uh, what exactly they, they, they mean by what they say, how their gestures are good or, 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 or indifferent, how, how they are cynical or, or believing, all these things uh, will be um, uh, totally uh, away from the influences of the city or the mainland in the country. So he, uh, Yates asked him to go to Aran Islands. Why should uh, Yates ask him? Uh, you, you might raise the question unto yourself. And my answer is that uh, Yates himself was uh, very much in love with the, the, the purity of, uh, you know, simple life. And uh, he would not like city life as much as uh, one might. And uh, Yates said, go, go to these islands, uh, learn the kind of life that these people lead, uh, learn simplicity from them, learn their folk tales from them, uh, and, you know, uh, make them imbibe the values uh, that those people carry. And uh, if you make that the center of your study, then perhaps you'll be able to write still better. So this is what uh, W.B. Yates asked Singe, and Singe agreed with him. He was a senior person and a visionary of great merit and one of the most famous people in uh, Ireland at that time. So Singe used that time to have a close look at Irish life. So Irish life, one that he had seen himself as a child, as, as a growing up person, and Irish life as uh, uh, existed, you know, away from the mainland uh, in the islands, and particularly the speech and habits of the islanders. Now, uh, you know, the, the speech changes, speech patterns change uh, from one place to another, and uh, if uh, one is completely cut off uh, from, from the mainland, then islands uh, have their own kind of language, and that language uh, compels you to struggle to understand. And uh, that struggle is very, uh, you know, useful uh, for a writer because a uh, writer has to, to struggle even for his own expression. And when this kind of a training is given to the writer, uh, you know, in, in actual life, then he is going to be a very powerful writer. That seems to have gone into the writing of this play. Uh, I am certain that uh, the, the, the play uh, carries the influence of now, uh, the, the studies that uh, J.M. Singh uh, at that time pursued, it was staged, the play was staged, uh, the, the playboy of the Western world I am talking about, it was staged in 1907. Uh, Singh died in 1909 at the young age of 38 years. So now I I'll tell you about these two things. One that uh, his best play, uh, arguably, had been written in 1907 and he was suffering from sarcoma. Sarcoma is a kind of cancer and it is a debilitating disease. Uh, every day one becomes weaker than before and uh, because the uh, disease would have been spotted sometime in the late 19th century, therefore he was all the time suffering and uh, imagine that uh, a person has, you know, the, the, the cancerous growth in, in one's body and uh, uh, one knows that uh, one can't live for a long time and yet because he was in touch with the feelings and emotions of the place where he lived and he wanted to express that in the artistic form. Therefore, uh, he would keep himself alive and keep himself all the time engaged in writing. And his writing has that kind of intensity and purity, partly also because he was suffering all the time as he wrote. So at the age of 38, the man dies in 1909, but then he has already written a number of plays by that time and that would have are definitely given give, given him a sense of fulfillment. Now, uh, I tell you about a few plays that he wrote. Uh, these, these plays are uh, When the Moon Has Set. This is written in 1901. 
which means that his serious writing begins apart from his poetry and, and, and his prose. He also wrote prose and he was a thinker. All those things were there at the background. But then since he was emerging as a playwright, so this activity uh, began at the turn of the century. And uh, the plays uh, which are, are notable are, are these ones, uh, When the Moon Has Set, Riders to the Sea, it's a one-act play, and uh, perhaps in India, in the Indian English courses, uh, this is taught even to the undergraduates, and uh, it's a very sad play. And then you have In the Shadow of the Glen and the Tinker's Wedding. Now, you can imagine that the, the tinker is an ordinary person, you know, giving services, um, all the time moving from one home to another. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, giving sort of services of, um, you know, mending, uh, you know, repairing the utensils of, of the households. So, so Tinker's, um, uh, he's, uh, you know, uh, picking up the character of a Tinker. And uh, then, you know, the, the Tinker's wedding, it, it, it really makes a very interesting uh, subject of um, a play that, that uh, uh, G.M. Singh would be talking about the, the marriage of the Tinker uh, in the play that he writes in 1904. So, you can imagine that uh, uh, the, the uh, titles that, that are there, uh, these titles are about nature, the moon has set, riders to the sea, so there is a sea also. And uh, uh, for the first time the word riders occurs, which means that he is talking about the riders, the people who go to the sea. And uh, whether they come back or not, that's the question that he's bring, bringing up. And the shadow of the glen, the place, and he's talking about the shadow and then the tinker. So, you just put these things together and you know that uh, the man is not talking about, uh, you know, the culture as we know the term. He's not talking about the city. He's not talking about uh, the ways of the successful people, the smart people, the, the, the people, you know, who, who, who will... Uh, own the world, the people who will rule the world, he is not talking about them at all. He is talking about the people who inhabit the earth. He is talking about the people who breathe in the, the atmosphere of, uh, you know, nature. And therefore, he is a writer of a different kind. Definitely, uh, his writing is going to be valuable and he comes from Ireland. So, he will have that kind of, you know, struggle to understand things, uh, you know, which are right and which are wrong and how, you know, the wrongs can be righted and how the right things can be defended. So, this seems to be, uh, you know, the kind of pursuit that he has all the time in his place and that makes him successful in the field of literature. Then I just uh, <coughs> uh, close this discussion. Uh, um, I, I refer to a few things. The issues of conformity and rebellion are at the core of Singe's dramatic writing. Uh, conformity means uh, conventional life, whatever is, uh, uh, you know, uh, taught to you, told you by the parents, by the teachers, by the neighbors, you just accept their views. That is called conformity. Conformity, uh, you know, is, is, is to just remain where you are and accept everything that you are told. That is conformity. So, we are born in a religious family, then you, you uh, uh, accept the religious, uh, you know, form, religious beliefs and, and you work accordingly. If you are born, you know, uh, somewhere in, in a forest and, and, and you have no idea about religion, then you will take the uh, paganism of, of, of the life uh, around the forest and uh, that's what conformity is. But then the issue of conformity, he confronts, he faces it and uh, there is a kind of a rebellious streak in him. Uh, what form it takes, he, he may not be uh, you know, knowing it consciously or he may be hiding it uh, in, in the depth of his heart. But then he is a rebellious person. He is a person with uh, the the uh, courage to uh, react, the courage to get back, to hit back. And, and uh, that is the, in fact, uh, when I started the discussion, I said that Ireland uh, is, is a place where people still believe in that their self-respect, still believe in their faith and, and, and would always be, you know, uh, uh, differing with you uh, and strongly differing with you if, if, if you somehow scratch them uh, on, on, on the wrong side and, and if you hurt them, then they will hit back. That is the culture of, uh, you know, Ireland and because of this, uh, a large part of Ireland has always been a constant struggle with the English, uh, you know, hegemony. Since his dramatic writing, uh, conformity and rebellion are two things. They are uh, uh, poised against each other. If you are a conformist, you can't rebel and if you are a rebel, you can't conform uh, to, to, to things around you. So, the struggle is there. 
in his mind always and in fact this struggle keeps him alive intellectually uh, emotionally uh, from the point of view of ideology and uh, in fact this uh, uh, he he might might pick up one kind of a character and he uh, would pitch him or her that character uh, along with another who doesn't agree with 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 the first one so this is what is what is called struggle and that will give birth to the ideas that he will express uh, you know in his uh, <coughs> uh play so uh, singe's dramatic uh, writing is uh, taking a lot of help from this and this involves christianity in the context of a small village in ireland because he is going to base this play uh, in, in in that village and he will show us as to how the people of the village so i i uh I conclude this uh, first part of the discussion uh, with, with this particular uh, idea in ireland clashes occurred along lines of acceptance of colonial rule of england and rejection of it upholding the banner of nationalism so most most of the irish people are nationalists and northern ireland and the irish republic <coughs> these are the two places that i refer to in fact already i mentioned them and they are two separate entities in the country and uh, it is these that the, the this person indirectly captures in his plays presents them for the viewers to understand thank you